All right. Well, people are going to start rolling in uh, as things go go through. But if uh, if Scott, you want to introduce yourself to the crowd and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, then we'll, we'll go from there. Sure. I'm Scott O'Neill. I'm a principal with FSO Capital Partners. Uh, we've syndicated about 35, 40 million bucks worth of real estate, uh, primarily throughout the Southwest, but really focused on Phoenix, uh, all multifamily. Um, focus on B and C class assets mostly. All right, Phoenix area. Good to know. Good to know. Uh, Todd, you wanna you wanna jump in now and, and say say a little bit about yourself? Still trying to get your uh, your background going. All righty. Um, while, while that's all going down, um, Scott, I got a question for you. Sure. Um, what, so, so in the Phoenix area right now, um, I know nationwide and even across the world have obviously shifted for real estate investors and the investment opportunities available. And that trend is going to continue on for, for, you know, the foreseeable future. But how have things changed in your mind and in your company and just viewing things, not even investment opportunities, but, but just looking at the landscape that's in front of you? How do how you adjust it? Well, I think the biggest uh, adjustment that we have to make, obviously, everybody's worried about their rent collections. They're worried about vacancy, um, especially with these unemployment figures that are coming out. But the biggest piece is the, the debt markets. The debt markets have been going wild. Uh, the volatility has been really crazy the last couple of weeks. And so when you're looking at a deal, uh, it's really hard to evaluate right now because you don't know what the financing is going to be like. Uh, so I think that we're really shifting from an environment where there was an abundance of capital out there and, I, and a lot of opportunity um, where – now, moving forward, there is going to be less access to capital and more deals on the market, right? Um, I don't think that that's happening immediately, but that's where I think the pendulum is. All right. Um, so, with, with capital, just you know, about, um, what do you see investment deals being more investor heavy and less lending because the the lending issue right now is that is that what you're really seeing? Yeah, sure. I mean, we've seen spreads blow out with Fannie and Freddie. Um, you know, local regional banks are quoting people I've heard at you know 6% in the last couple of weeks because the CMBS market is so backed up. Um, and so you know that's gonna really impact pricing. If, if the cost of your capital uh, has increased dramatically, then cap rates have to shift, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so, so Todd, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself now and, uh, and what's going on with you and, and what things are looking like in your market. Uh, yeah, a little bit about me. I'm a multifamily syndication uh, investor. Um, and, you know, I, I guess things are similar. We're not, I'm, I haven't been seeing local banks actually changing the rates. Uh, I've got a deal right now active. I'm still getting quotes uh, in the threes and, and low fours. So I haven't seen any adjustment there. The one thing I have seen is um, down payment amount has gone up. So we had a couple lenders give us pricing at 20% down payment. Uh, now we're seeing 25 and 30%. Somebody's got some feedback going there. If you, if you guys aren't talking, try to put this up on mute. Oh, oh, somebody's got some crazy feedback on, so there you go. Um, 
Yeah, so, so I mean, we're seeing still some lending opportunities, but it's local banks. And, you know, right now I think your lending opportunities are going to be local banks and agency debt, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, government, government backed, um, you know, HUD. Um, those are going to be your probably best opportunities. Um, your, your kind of regional and national banks are, are basically shut down. You know, they're, they're not open for business for the most part. Uh, they're the first ones to run. They're the last ones to get back in. Um, that's just how they, how they typically operate. Uh, so, um, but I, I think right now it feels like most investors are kind of in a wait and see mode. Uh, here's what I would say. If you are looking at selling an asset, I would be selling it. I would be listing it still right now because we might not be a seller's market anymore, but I think we're still, we're like a net neutral right now. So if you're looking to sell, I, I would be selling. If you're looking to buy, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say don't buy, but uh, we might see better opportunity coming down the pipeline. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, Todd, with, just vetting opportunities moving forward. How is that shift looking for you in, in terms of, you know, what are you going to be looking for now that you weren't necessarily looking at before, not even just with an investor standpoint, but, but really just, you know, overall view on, on an opportunity that, that comes to you. So I don't think a ton, quite frankly, for me has changed because I've always taken a conservative approach. There's a few things that have maybe changed, um, just in what I'm looking for a little bit. Um, and, and I'm also also an opportunist. So I'm also looking for opportunity as well. So I'm always keeping my eyes open to what the paradigm shifts are going to be. Every market, every cycle has different paradigm shifts, right? The last cycle, we saw these uh, younger people, they saw their parents get foreclosed on and they saw all this hardship that was happening during the great recession. And they said, I don't want to own a house. I'm going to rent. And that's kind of what happened. And now it's been a long time since that happened. And now we've got this COVID uh, recession happening and they're going to, they kind of forget about the great recession and they're going to remember the last thing that just happened, which is this. And so how is that paradigm shifting? How are they thinking now differently? What's going to be the differences? And I think that's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. I've got my own opinions, which we can talk about certainly, um, but it doesn't mean they're, they're right. They're just kind of what my theory has been, and we have to keep our eyes open. So as far as underwriting differences right now, what I'm looking at is uh, – Looking at making sure my properties are currently occupied and running well, uh, any, any properties that we're looking at purchasing, I want them to be occupied. I want them to be running well. I want cash flow day one because I think it's going to be tough to get new tenants in. I want to look at um, or get new paying tenants in, I should say. Um, I want to look at properties that have expense reduction uh, capabilities. So I want to be able to put in LED packages. I want low flow, you know, toilets and fixtures and stuff like that. I want a property that's been running not very lean at all. And for me to come in and be able to operate it efficiently, those are big things. And then, um, you know, I'm not looking at big rent bumps. I'm looking at, does this property work today in today's market? I might be able to get some rent bumps, but I don't want to project these massive, increases then continual three to five percent rent increases which i was never doing in the first place but a lot of people were i don't want to see that because i don't think we're going to see i think we're going to see rent stagnation and maybe actually a little bit of regression in our rents uh, and same with thing with our vacancy rates we might not see bigger vacancy rates but we're going to see economic occupancy go down right economic meaning people that can actually pay so that's what's going to happen, uh, and so you got to be aware of that. The big, the other big thing that I'm doing, and I was already doing this, but I'm actually stepping it up even bigger, is my reserve accounts. I'm making sure. Prior to it, I made sure I had nine months worth of principal and interest. Now I'm buying larger multifamily, so with larger multifamily, I want to see now 12 months worth of principal and interest in liquidity to be able to 
bring into the property if I need to. Now, if you're dealing with smaller multifamily, I'll call it like a 20 unit or, or below, I would consider having six months worth of total expenses in a liquid bank account. Okay, um, and, and you were talking earlier about how, for you specifically, that right now the interest rates really haven't changed, but the down payment requirements have. They've, they've bumped that up a little bit. And Scott had also mentioned how he, he's expecting that the actual capital is going to, um, that, that's needed for the deal is going to need to go up. And you mentioned the reserves, all that. Is that pretty much just an expectation across the board that, um, that we're going to need more investors and more capital behind these deals or you're not really looking at that right now. You, you have a, a good flow going at the moment and, and you're not really looking at that next step yet, quite yet. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, cer certainly looking forward at new deals and, and I'm optimistic that there'll be opportunities here coming. Real estate's a slow game, so it's not going to be tomorrow. Um, but there's opportunities that will be coming down the pipeline. And with that, you've got to be aware of uh, any changes in your underwriting. And one of those changes is more capital that I'll have to bring to the table via down payment and, and also uh, just overall reserve and um, capital improvement potentially, but, but overall reserve. Now, the one thing that might change, we talk about down payment. Now your down payment amount might have to be a little bit bigger. Maybe we have a little bit higher debt service coverage ratio. Um, but here's the thing, if prices go down 15, 20, 30%, if you can buy something even lower than that, your debt service coverage ratio is actually gonna cover. And what was happening recently, and I shouldn't say recently, over the last like three years, is a lot of people are buying these properties where in order to hit their debt service coverage ratio, they're gonna come in at a 35, percent down payment just to be able to hit that 1.25 so now if you're buying it for you know a 20 percent discount you still might have to put a third you, you might actually be, be able to get down to a 30 percent down payment. so it might actually need less money um so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out and, and that's to be determined uh how much these you know properties are discounted i think we're going to see a discount no matter what just don't know how big yeah, absolutely. And that, that's a good point. You know, the, with the down payment going up, with the cost going down, you're, you're evening out or even, you know, getting even better a little bit. Um, now, Kaylee's in the house now, so uh, I want to welcome her and, and give her a chance to, to speak about herself, her market, um, just what's going on in your world. Hey everybody, what's going on? Um, I wanted to hop on a little bit uh, on time, but I'm late, so I'm here better than ever. Um, what were we talking about? You said market, uh, kind of what I do, that's it? Yeah, yeah, just general information about yourself and then we'll, we'll jump into some things. Sure, so um, I probably do the same thing as like everybody else, but I don't know, I missed a few things. So looking for C-class properties, I would buy multifamily, 100 doors plus, uh, looking in Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Austin, San Antonio, and we do have some properties in Phoenix. Um, and there's a few other things we're looking for, which like you were mentioning a second ago, Todd, um, we may hit some of those metrics now. We've always been looking for 15 to 20% below market rent. Um, and based on certain things, we may be able to get that at a reasonable price now instead of someone wanting us to buy on a future value based on uh, versus what it's now. So that's a little bit about what we're looking for, um, who I am. Uh, so our brand is the Apartment Queen, and so we are a completely woman-facing business. And our why or our motivation is to be able to put more women in the shoes of principals, brokers, and really be more leader, uh, more have more women leaders in the multifamily uh, commercial space. Awesome. So, what um, for, for you, Kaylee? You're most almost completely in the Texas area. You mentioned Phoenix. Scott's Scott's out in Phoenix, um, investing there. How often are you visiting and actually, you know, interacting with? each of the, the different deals that you're involved in? Because Phoenix is a little ways away. Um, how do you look on that? How do you review that and make sure that things are going well? Um, just, just with that deal in, in particular, just out of curiosity. 
Yeah, so um, really being being focused in what I like, what I call a sandbox. So having your little sandbox that you fit in, whether it's you know what kind of investors you're looking for, whether it's the kind of deals you're looking for, your market, whatever it is that you do, being very specific and um, being very disciplined in your criteria and staying in that sandbox and trying not to go out of it. Now that Phoenix deal was kind of an accident because a couple partners I had done a deal with already who were just like excellent, excellent communicators. They just underwrite really well. They're trustworthy. I mean, just great people to do a deal with. Uh, they happened to find something in Phoenix that was in a market where a C class average was going for like 115 a door and we were able to get in at 71 K a door with renovations included. Um, and it was, it was just a great deal, you know? So I was like, well, I can't, <laughs> I can't say no, but being remote. So of course, you know, there's a couple of uh, areas of concern. I know my sandbox really well. You know, I know what insurance costs here. I know what utilities costs here. I know all those things that you normally put in for your assumptions when you're in another market. Um, unless I have a current deal there, it's really hard to figure out exactly like actuals. So you'd need to know like another property owner or someone else that um, would be willing to show you their profit and loss statement. That's kind of what I go off of. So you can see what they're literally paying every month, you know? Um, and uh, so luckily for every deal that's not right in my direct sandbox here, um, minus a few in West Texas that I um, did on my own with one other partner. So I'm the one going out there all the time. Um, we usually have boots on the ground for each deal. So for example, if we're in that Phoenix market, we have uh, Jack Adwo. He is there. So he's the one that's visiting it every month. So he's the one like in our deals, we have like a, an asset management fee. So he's the one getting that the whole thing. We don't take any of it because he's the one showing up and getting us pictures and getting us what we need for reports, checking in with property managers um, on local deals. Um, I, depending on the structure of our team, you know, who is doing um, the fundraising, who's doing the underwriting, who's doing operations. We always try to figure that out up front, but sometimes those gears switch. So mentioning being here locally uh, and knowing it really well. So I've had some partners that like one lives in Hawaii, one lives in Florida, two live in Arizona and I'm here and we have a deal here. Uh, and so I don't mind you know, driving the property, snapping some pics and saying, Hey, the, the lawn hasn't been mowed or, Hey, I'm not happy with the sign or, Hey, and, and they trust me because of that. So our roles have kind of switched because the person that's boots on the ground, boots on the ground there locally should be the one I think, you know, putting eyes on the property um, and, and knowing it just really well. So you kind of have to have some trust when you're going outside of your market and lean on people who have already done uh, deals there. Absolutely. Um, Todd, Todd, speak a little bit about your situation in reviewing current investments because in the chat you mentioned you're in Minneapolis, Cincinnati, Lexington, Memphis, different areas. You, you, you can't be visiting those. You, you have to have people um, checking those out for you. What's that that sort of review and checking process look like for you? Um, yeah, it, definitely not, not flying out to those areas right now. Um, I, you know, I've got third-party property management in all those areas, so it's just a weekly phone call, uh, sometimes more. Um, trying to be proactive, trying to get a game plan going. I mean, there was a lot of planning. Obviously, we, I shouldn't say we saw this coming, but this has been going on for a while. Um, so we did see some, we did have some pre-planning prior to everything getting shut down as we could kind of see it starting um, and potentially happening. Uh, of course, I think everything is was still pretty shocking um, to, to pretty much everybody. But, uh, but yeah, we're, it's just about communication with our property management company, making sure they're communicating with our, our residents, uh, coming up with plans to be able to work with residents. Um, I think that just that open dialogue is, is ultra important. Um, being on site, it doesn't really, isn't really that necessary, honestly. Um, so, as long as you've so, got that. So let me, let me just cut in, uh, Todd. You have one property management company or, or you have each locally uh, centered property managers. Um, yes. and how did you find that? How did you, you know, do that process? Yeah, I've got three property management companies. Um, one for my Ohio properties. Uh, one for my Kentucky properties. And then one for my Tennessee properties. Um, so they're, they're, they're regional, uh, players, uh, regional slash local, you know, so my, my 
Kentucky uh, manager manages between Lexington and Louisville and uh, in Cincinnati, Lexington it manages just Cincinnati. And then my, my uh, Tennessee one manages all of Tennessee and so a lot of that deep South and, it, you know, relationship building, I think was probably how I found those relationship building and, uh, you know, getting referrals. I ask for referrals. I'm, I'm, I'm huge on asking for referrals. So I'm always asking the, the brokers referrals, the, uh, the lenders referrals. I mean, I'm asking everybody for referrals and then trying to match and marry those referrals up because you tend to get some of the same names over and over. Um, so that's always been, been really important to get those referrals. And then quite frankly, I mean, th just through, um, through trial and error, uh, I've, I, I've had two property management companies in Kentucky. I've had three in Ohio. I've had only one uh, in Tennessee. Uh, so far, so that that one's been good, but um, you know sometimes you have to fire them and let them go and and move on to the next one. <laughs> it's never fun to fire uh, because it always sets your property back a couple months, but uh, it's definitely necessary if you want to move forward and be successful too. Absolutely, um, Scott. Can can you share a little bit about what uh, what's going on? In Phoenix, and I know you had just started up um, your, your new uh, company, FSO Capital Partners. Uh, what's that transition looked like? What what's have you had any specific issues because of this uh, pandemic? And if so, how have you overcome those, or how are you planning to overcome those? Just you know, get a general sense of where you're at and, and some specifics too. For sure. Yeah, similar uh, to Todd. We did some proactive planning on the front end. We stopped all of our CapEx projects unless they were already midstream. Um, so we're not spending any money on the units that we don't have to unless it's to make them rent ready. Um, getting letters out to tenants, informing them that their rent is still due, even though we can't evict right now. Um, working with the tenants that can't pay, that can show financial hardship. Um, and then informing them of resources that are at their disposal to try and be able to, to afford the rent, to be able to pay. And so those are the things that we've done proactively. So far, not a big drop off in April. We would uh, beat expectations. I thought it was gonna be a lot worse than it was, but I think May and June are gonna be tough months, definitely. Yeah. So um, specifically, uh, where where were you at? If you don't mind me getting into a little bit of the nitty gritty on what your expectations were and how you actually um, beat that out, maybe as as broad or as specific as as you want to get. You know what? I mean, that's a hard question because none of us have ever dealt with this before. So it's totally shooting in the dark. We plan for our collections to drop thirty percent. They really only dropped. 10% and then since then now that we're in the middle of the month that numbers come down to about 5% um, I have properties that are 100% collected and then I have other properties that have a little bit tougher tenant demographic um, Where we're you know 85% collected and so it's really just monitoring those situations really staying in on top of your management company and making sure that they're reaching out to those tenants and coming up with some sort of a payment structure or a workout plan uh, with those tenants. Great. Uh, Kaylee, you're shaking your head. Oh. What were you saying, Todd? Can I jump in real quick? Yeah, for sure. Uh, things I want to piggyback on that. Uh, the letter to the tenants, uh, we did the same, and I think that was really important to just communicate with your tenants. Um, that, you know, we, we did mention rent is due, but you know, you do it on a, on a polite way, right? You're not like, hey, jackass, pay your rent. Um, but you, you do it in a polite way, obviously. Um, and, and just make sure they understand. That. And then with the tenants who aren't paying rent uh, right now and haven't worked out a payment plan, we're just trying to communicate with them, send them letters, make sure they understand. that. Because what we don't want to do is we don't – eviction courts are eventually going to open up, and we don't want to be evicting a ton of people. Um, so if they've you know, made some sort of effort, we're willing to work with them. And that's what we want to make sure people understand. As far as collections, you know, we're the same in April. Um, as Scott mentioned, uh, very similar. Some of our properties are 100% collected. Um, some of our properties are 
you know, we're, we're 10%, 15% below where we're this time last month. So pounds, but, um, you know, May and June will be interesting. I'm actually optimistic about them because we've got all this money coming in, the stimulus money coming in and they're hitting tenants bank accounts, hopefully, uh, in May and June. I think what will get really interesting is once stimulus runs out, um, what's going to happen, you know, and what's the employment level look like then. And so once that runs out and they're only getting, you know, 50 to 60% of their income, uh, previous income, normal unemployment checks, you know, what's that going to look like and how's, how's that going to shake out? Um, of course, you still have the no eviction thing going on right now, but uh, I, th- I think the, the, the thing I'm really looking down the road uh, to the late summer and into the fall and anticipating uh, higher vacancy rates during that time and, and lower economic occupancy. So, sorry, Kaylee. All right, stole maybe stole your thunder, but no, that, that's that's good stuff, Todd. Uh, Kaylee, you were shaking your head a lot with uh, with what Scott was saying, and agreeing, and Todd Todd was saying similar numbers. What's that been looking like for you? Um, can you give some specifics? Uh, have you had mentioned on our last call that we had that, that some people were just leaving and, you know, you, you can't evict, but, but people are still leaving. Um, just give us a little bit of insight into what it looks like in your market. So each, each property is different. I actually have like 50 units in a tertiary market. And um, even though a lot of people thought originally that that situation would be a really big risky situation, there's zero COVID in that county. Zero. It's not a problem. No one's leaving. No one's job is affected because of that at all. Um, and so the people that are leaving, um, I made sure that we were communicating up front, you know, hey, um, what, what did we say in the beginning that we were going to, um, there's like five different things, but basically gave them resources. Um, said, you know, by the way, rent, rent is due on the first. Um, and what we're going to do for everyone this month is we are going to waive any late fees. So you can pay any time this month, as long as there is payment made this month. Um, because we just felt like, you know, as long as you pay it, it doesn't matter right now. If you can, you can. And again, we'll work with you. Uh, please come speak with us if there is an issue um, with, you know, current employment. And again, we have those resources to show you how to apply for unemployment, how to apply for uh, WIC if you, if you, um, if you qualify, all these other things. Um, and so if, as long as we were communicating, you know, that we would work with everybody, there's not much that I could do. It's just real unfortunate. Like I was mentioning those skips. Um, they don't understand that, or maybe they do and don't care because, you know, it is what it is, but um, that, that ruins your credit. You know what I mean? Like it's going to be really hard for you to rent after this. And so I hated that, but we did communicate with everybody. So um, what we've really done was, and actually that, that provided an opportunity to tell you the truth, having people leave, uh, they just pack up their, their crap and leave, um, is that we don't have to deal with not being able to evict them and them staying and then just, you know, taking up our resources and whatnot. So what I focused on is we really only on those properties have one person who's kind of just like, I'm not, I'm not leaving. I'm not paying. I'm not whatever. So we're figuring that out. But anyway, um, everybody else, when we have those open units, what I've done is we've spent more money now on advertising and Facebook marketing and putting money on Google and bringing more traffic into the property. So we've doubled our traffic um, in the last week um, now that I've created some ads and so we've gotten double the amount of leases, you know, too. So again, when you're looking at the people that are, that you're leasing up with, it's very important to me that like, I got excited. We had people that were VA, people that were SSI, people that, you know, have guaranteed income. So I was like, okay, that's cool. You know, um, go ahead and, and be a part of our property and, and being creative. You know, we had some people that are um, transient in the area and talking about doing like a three month long lease in a, I can't say to them corporate unit because the, they're, they would get turned off by our city mumbo jumbo, you know, but saying it's a furnished unit. So we can do a furnished unit um, where basically we do three months at a time. They pay first month and last month up front. Um, and what we can charge in that area, normally rent is like 600 and 650, depending uh, for a nice newer unit. We bought it under 500 uh, per unit. And for those units that are furnished, we can charge about $900 per month. Now we will have, um, some all bills included kind of thing, but, uh, we have two of those already and, um, the people end up staying actually for longer usually. Um, but there's, there's an extra, um, 150 net that we get after paying bills ish per month 
having that unit just because it's short term. So, I mean, whatever, you just have to be creative. So that's kind of some things that we've done is beefing up marketing, bringing in new people, being creative with what units we have. Um, and we've been a little bit blessed, like I said, that the people that maybe they already know they can't pay at all, they just, they leave, you know, maybe go back home with mom and dad or something like that. So, um, so far collections have been actually the same or better as before. And, um, like I said, we're just really pushing to finish off the rest of the units because what's going to happen in those small markets, it's surrounded by schools and stuff. Um, as soon as people can get out of their house, they're going to be in a rush to lease up because it is still hot season. And so if we can be the complex that has all the units ready, they're going to get filled up in two seconds. So that is just a very unique property, very unique area, very unique situation. Whereas the stuff that we have in Dallas and the city, it, it, it tracks a little bit more along with what you guys were saying. Um, where you do a couple of those proactive things and, and people are staying and we're kind of working with them. We stop spending CapEx um, and we're kind of just, uh, just waiting, you know? Awesome. I, you're the first person to, to talk about such a creative um, approach to, to just handling it because you, you have to, you have to bring in the money however you can. And if it's short term, it's short term and, and you can move on from there, but at least you're getting something in, uh, in that short term. I'm curious if either Todd or, or Scott, you guys have, have done anything creative in that aspect to avoid vacancy issues or if, if you're preparing to do anything like that. Um, and other than that, uh, I really want to open it up to, to anybody that, that wants to ask questions to Todd, Kaylee, Scott, just general questions that you might have specifics if you'd like. So one of the things that we're doing right now um, is to the tenants that either can't pay or are refusing to pay because of the, uh, the moratorium on evictions, um, I'm letting them, the, our property manager know to go back to those tenants and offer them part of their security deposit back or in some cases uh, their whole security deposit back just to pack up and go because we're better off with that tenant not in the building. Um, and using our utilities and using our resources uh, than letting them live there for free, right? And then at least we have the chance of, of leasing those units out. And actually, surprisingly enough, our leasing activity has not dropped off drastically. I just leased two units last week um, that blew our pro forma rents out by $100 a month. Those are on uh, two bed, two baths that are about 1,000 square feet. Uh, at $1,400 a month. So people are still out there and they're still looking and I don't know if that's something that's unique to Phoenix just because we've had such a boom in, in population growth and we're so undersupplied here. Um, and then another thing that we did was we offered a $25 gift card to the local grocery stores um, around our surrounding our complexes for any tenants that paid their rent on time this month. Um, and we plan to continue to do that. And it's something that's small uh, that we think has gone a long way, at least in April. I love that. That, that is awesome. Todd, want to chime in? Um, well, yeah, as far as showing activity, we've seen uh, good showing activity. We've actually increased our occupancy through this time as well. Um, we have seen a slowdown, definitely. I, I, not necessarily a slowdown from previous months, but a slowdown from like this time last year, um, what you would, what you would expect. Um, so it's not, not quite what we would want to see, but we're still seeing activity. Oh, I have to go get you something to eat, huh? Um, <laughs> we, uh, you know, I, I, we haven't done anything too creative. Um, I guess one of our properties, we hung, we hung a roll of toilet paper on everybody's door, uh, with a nice little note. Um, that was kind of fun. Um, we we did offer a discount on rent uh, for a couple of our properties that we knew were going to be pretty hard hit by it uh, if they paid their rent on time. Um, and then as far as getting new tenants in, uh, we haven't done anything creative, which I, I kind of like some of the ideas. So we'll have to do some brainstorming and what what else we can do. Uh, but we're we're actually doing pretty well on occupancy um, right now, so I don't want to get too carried away. Good. Yeah. If you don't need to be creative, you don't need to be creative. And, and you have these ideas for, for down the line. If things are getting worse in May and June, you have those opportunities available to you to, to consider. 
Um, th does anybody have any questions? Um, I'm sure there's something brewing in somebody's mind out there. You can put it in the chat if you'd like, or you can unmute yourself and, and ask away. All right, does anyone see a difference in tenants paying between B class and C class? Uh, Todd, you wanna start us off? Yeah, I mean, so far we've got both B and C. Our Bs have paid uh, definitely more, but that's, that's typical. I mean, so I wouldn't say it's any, any difference than Previously, I mean, our B tenants are all pretty much all paid up. Our C tenants are kind of right where they typically are. Um, I, I, you know, I think one of the things that's giving both B and C tenants uh, a good opportunity to continue to pay is all the government stimulus. So they're getting most people are actually getting pay raises uh, right now. If they're making under about sixty thousand a year, they're actually getting a a pay raise. They're actually better off being unemployed than they are being employed. Um, so that helps you know, our B and C class tenants. The people that are potentially gonna get hurt the worst if they get laid off are the A class tenants, if they're making a lot of money and they don't get as much uh, for stimulus, maybe they don't qualify for that $1,200 check. Um, you know, maybe their employment, they're making a lot of money and, and now they actually get a pay deduction. Uh, those are the people that are gonna probably get hurt the worst, um, short term. You know, long term is maybe a different story, uh, but short term, that's what we're seeing. Your your comment on A class actually brings up an interesting point. We've got a lot of new delivery in Phoenix on A class, and so there's a lot of lease up going on. Um, and I've heard that some of those properties are now offering you know 20, 25 percent discounts on rent to get those units full. Um, and that's one of the things that's of concern to me certainly here because I think that's a matter of time before that trickles down to to start affecting some of the B class properties for sure. Yeah. Uh, um, so I I, I, I I agree definitely with Scott, but it's to a point, right? Because A class tenants like A class stuff, right? They're used to high end things. B class tenants and C class tenants, especially like C class is not looking to live in a, an A class building. They're just not like you can give them a huge concession. They still can't afford to pay 2,500 bucks a month for even, even if it's for, you know, eight months, like you can give them four months for free. They still can't afford it. Right. So it's not like they're looking to move up. They're stuck at where they're at. Same with, for, for the most part, B class and A class just doesn't, like those tenants just, they don't really want to move down to a C class property, C class neighborhood. So instead what you're going to see is the A class are just going to find a roommate so they can afford it potentially. Um, so I think A class will potentially suffer a lot with the new deliveries until that can catch up. So I agree with Scott, like the, we will see some ripple effects, but I think it'll be to a lesser extent as you go down. Um, but, you know, that's, that's just my opinion. So Linda asked, if the virus situation continues long term, will the rental market increase due to homeowners not being able to afford their homes? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, pretty logical, right? Uh, if people can't afford their house and I mean, we'll see how long there's a, uh, a forbearance on these mortgages. And then I saw JP Morgan increase their, uh, for their lending standards for single family to 20% and 700 plus credit scores. So, I mean, you're going to see the credit markets tighten up, uh, in that asset class as well, which I think bodes well for us as apartment owners. And I think that there's certainly going to be more people living in apartments for longer career renters. Um, when do you think that that shift is going to start going up um, just because there is that, that pause that banks and the government has been giving right now? When do you think you're going to start seeing that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a matter of how long that that goes on, you know? Um, and so I haven't looked too closely at that to speak 
intelligently on it, but certainly as long as they're granting these forbearances, I wouldn't expect that to, to change drastically, but at some point it will. Yeah. And, uh, okay. So, so Ben asked, do you, wait, 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 wait. okay, Kaylee, what do you got? Uh, the only other thing on that to consider is the forbearances. I keep having to remind people about this on uh, every call because uh, it depends on the bank and what is written into the forbearance. Because like for me, for example, um, I was going to do a cash out refinance on a single family where I have a, a rental in it or a renter in it. And um, the forbearance would one, stop me from being able to do the, uh, the refi. So not doing that. Uh, and then the other problem was on the back end, depending on the verbiage inside the forbearance, um, there's a deferral and then there's a forbearance. They're, they're different things depending on what's in there. Uh, normally for a forbearance, what happens is that your 90 days of P&I or uh, payments and interest, they get accumulated at the fourth month, including that fourth month payment in a balloon. So the lender will usually say, yeah, 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 we'll just do a loan modification whenever you get to that point. But I don't really know what's going to happen with the market. I don't know what's going to happen with lending. I don't know if that's a guaranteed thing that will happen. So that's one thing. The other thing that can happen after uh, the forbearance is over is that you can foreclose or they can foreclose or you can kick the can down another four months doing another forbearance. And again, that's just making your problem worse. Eight more months worth of P&I. Like, I don't know anyone that's going through a financial hardship that can uh, fix that problem later. They're, they're, they're screwing themselves over and all those adjustments ruin your credit. So unless in the writing, the lender is basically going to either pre-authorize a, um, a loan modification or put it in the loan where it's spread out or it's put as a balloon at the very end of the note. But I actually recommend if someone's uh, considering doing that and they're not going to refire anything and uh, whatnot is to be able to see if their lender can add the um, not do a forbearance, but ask their lender to essentially make a line item fee on their loan. So um, not do anything to the loan, but the line item fee would be worth 90 days worth of P&I, and that would get tacked on to like the statement whenever you refinance out or whenever you sell. So at that point in time, that line item, like the Corona fee or whatever you want to call it, that's equal to this amount would be due only at that time and it then doesn't affect the loan or your credit or anything like that. So I think a lot of people aren't reading documents. I think a lot of people aren't thinking about that. They're just panicking and doing something. And so then I think that at the end of the forbearance period, we're going to see a lot more people getting out of single family. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I think a lot depends on how deep this cuts us, right? How, how long it goes for. Um, you know, as far as long term, like what happens if this goes long term and continues? for a long time. I, I don't think it, multifamily is insulated by any means. I think single family is going to get affected. I think multifamily is going to get affected. I think we're going to see potentially higher occupancy levels, but that's physical occupancy. We, we need to think about economic occupancy. Economic occupancy is the tenants that can actually pay. And if they can't afford a mortgage, do you expect them to afford your rent that's nearly the same amount as their mortgage? Uh, you know, probably not, uh, unless you're going to drop your rents. And so we got to think about, you know, as, as property owners, what's coming down the road or potentially coming down the road, right? And then prepare for that. And so that that's the that's why it's prudent to have good capital reserves from the beginning. You know, the companies that were buying these properties with two months worth of capital reserves in their pocket or maybe even less are going to be in for a world of hurt if this continues to cut us deeper. Um, so... Will it help multifamily? I, I, I would say it won't help multifamily. Will it hurt it? Yeah, I think it will. I mean, the longer this goes, the deeper the recession goes, it's going to hurt it. Now, is multifamily a good, safe investment to still be in? I think absolutely. Like, I would have rather have my money parked in multifamily than a lot of other asset classes. But at the same time, it, I think it's foolish to think that we're not going to get hurt by it. Yeah, it, it definitely good to be cautious um, and, and not get over optimistic about anything. Um, ben wants to know uh, if there's one class or, or you know a certain class in particular that that might be a better opportunity to get into uh, with all this happening, just because of the the impact that low low income employees are, are seeing um, and their their losses. Really, um, do, does anybody want to? shed some light on different the different asset classes and what makes one more or less uh, pretty. 
Well, I mean, long, long term, A class is typically going to fare better. But as Scott already mentioned, there's a lot of cities, and a ton of deliveries. So short term, that could get really dicey there if there's a ton of deliveries happening and, you know, people are, you know, trying to live together instead of getting their own one bedroom. And so I think that that could be an interesting, you know, to what happens, a big thing that's going to be very interesting. And I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody here that's talking has a high rise in an urban core, but I think those high rises in the urban core are going to be slaughtered, you know, personally, because if you're sitting in a cell block right now in downtown on the 52nd floor and you don't feel like taking the elevator down because you don't want to get COVID, you don't want to walk through the hallways and it, heck, you can't, you can't even fathom going up 50 flights of stairs just to get to your apartment. You know, you're stuck in your cell and you're getting Uber Eats every day and you, you, you enjoyed going downtown to, to, you know, be at a restaurant and, uh, you know, go out to the bars and you went to your, your room just to sleep basically and maybe use the gym, but that's closed down now. Um, why do you want to live there? So I think suburban uh, type apartment buildings are going to probably it fare better. Uh, and I would think B class would probably fare the best. Uh, C classes, a lot of those people are out of work. Um, and granted right now they're making more money. Actually, well, maybe not, but eventually I would think stimulus would run out and they would, you know, be suffering quite a bit where B class, I think a, little, a lot more, you know, they're still going to get affected, but a lot more of those people can work from home, work from their computers and, uh, and still be employed. Um, okay. So Cameron said, Todd, what's the best way to communicate with brokers when looking at current numbers versus pro forma right now? Do you anticipate them to double down that uh, the pro forma numbers can still be considered as possible in the current environment? If so, how would you respond? Well, and I'll let uh, Bailey and Scott answer this too because I'm sure they've got their own opinions. But uh, it, brokers are smart. They, they, they know what's going on. They're optimistic, right? They're trying to sell you a property. But even before this happened, I would talk to a lot of brokers and go, man, this, this pro forma just isn't possible. And I go, I know, I wouldn't buy the property at that price. You know, and so they, most of these brokers understand it. Um, so they're smart, but they're trying to sell a property and they're trying to maximize the dollar value out of it. So are their performers a little pie in the sky sometimes? Absolutely. Right now, you've got to just be communicating with them and telling them uh, realities that are going on right now. You know, obviously, with the scenarios that are happening, we can't underwrite rent increases at this point in time. You know, our, our rent is going to be stagnant or maybe even declining. Um, we've got to, you know what? Yeah, sure, you show 5% vacancy rate. But in reality, we're at, we, we've got to underwrite an economic vacancy of 10%. You know, so I think just being clear and communicative with them is going to help. And, uh, and you know, their pro forma numbers, you can kind of almost throw them out the window, which quite obviously you could as well. So um, you got to base it on your own underwriting and, and reality. So I was a broker in the LA area for about 10 years. So I've been on both sides of this coin. Um, but I think really the best way to combat that is to really come back at them with some hard data. Um, I mean, you can point to unemployment increases, and I think that's probably the easiest one right now. And the biggest thing that you can do is, hey, the world looks worse tomorrow than it did yesterday in the immediate future. And so if somebody is going to sit there and sell you on the fact that the world looks better tomorrow, there's a lot of things that we can point at uh, to make a really good case for ourselves that those pro formas aren't achievable. And I would absolutely double down on, on speaking to those points. Hey guys, I don't know if, uh, if you mind if I jump in for a second, but uh, my name is Bogey. I'm a friend of Scotty's and uh, I'm a broker out in Southern California. And um, we primarily work on like 10 to 50 unit buildings and we just redid oh and by the way todd thanks for saying that we're smart i don't know if everyone would make that same uh compliment but i appreciate it 
Um, they think they're smart at least. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, <clears throat> so what we've done is we've just, you know, we took all of our listings, we re underwrote everything um, using higher economic vacancy factors, uh, using um, new lending criteria with higher DCRs, uh, with the reserves, with everything else, with the, dumbing down our pro forma rents. Um, it, you're right, there's some brokers out there that will put stuff out and then they'll, they'll claim to you, yeah, I wouldn't buy the deal either. Um, and no, those are not achievable. Um, you know, if you wanna be in this business for the long term, it, you gotta go the opposite way and you gotta tell the truth and you gotta be able to show, you know, guys like yourselves and girls like yourselves, like this is realistic. This is what the deal can do, um, and I mean that will keep you in the business for as a long term for a broker. Um, but you don't want something to be presenting to you if you're a seller either that you're something that's not achievable either because it's going to come back to haunt you. If not, you know, on day one, thirty days in after due diligence, they're going to blow out of the deal because those things weren't achievable. So everything has been re underwritten, but we are re underwriting on a weekly basis right now. Um, and we've actually gone to looking at assumable debt on all of the properties that we have listed to show what that picture looks like. And so we have uh, financing um, scenarios for uh, new debt, financing scenarios for assumption debt um, in every one of our packages. And that's actually been really helpful in just communicating with the buying community out there because um, there may be some other opportunities from an assumption or maybe all-inclusive trustees or wraparound loans or some other opportunities in order to buy something um, that you didn't really look at or didn't need to look at um, or didn't care to look at, you know, six weeks ago. Um, so yeah, we're, we're working on, you know, maybe not every broker's doing this, but definitely um, trying to underwrite to the real, you know, the real future or the real now. Um, and I went through the last downturn and that's the same thing that we had to do. I mean, we, we underwrote properties every single week just to, to stay on top of it because you're chasing it down, right? And it's harder to chase it down than to chase it up as a broker. So when you're, you know, when the market's going good, you look at the last comp, you price it up by five or 10%, you take it out to the market. Now, because we don't really have true comps yet, it's hard to see what things are selling for and how to underwrite in terms of a value, um, unless you're just looking at yield only. Um, so. It's, it's a lot of work uh, from the broker standpoint. We're doing, you know, 10 times the work for about a tenth of the pay right now. Well, it's going to be a snowball effect, right? Because the properties will hit the market. People buy them. And then another property will hit and somebody won't buy it quite as fast. And then, then there will, all of a sudden there will be five properties, 10 properties, 15 properties. And that's when you see the prices start to go. And I'm not going to say they're going to go down by 50% or anything, but that's when you see the prices start to go as the inventory comes on and people can't, the buyers can't keep up with it. And that flips to a buyer's market. And so, yeah, the brokers are always chasing uh, the market downward right. uh, in this time, which sucks for a broker. But uh, Kaylee, you were going to say something. Yeah, sure. So I am actually really excited uh, for this time right now because I am probably not a broker's favorite buyer. I pretty much clung on to some criteria that my mentor, mentor's mentor, were able to have success with for like 20 years straight, you know? So I'm like, well, why would I reinvent the wheel? You know, if it works, it works. So asking for kind of ridiculous things in what was, you know, a really hot market, uh, they just look at me and just, no, are you kidding me? I'll go to somebody that's coming in from one of the coasts, they'll overpay for something. And I'm like, that's fine. So I'm really only good to a broker when someone falls out of something, then I catch them. That's how I've gotten our deals really is just something doesn't work out and then I'm there. So now people are a little bit more open to, so two deals this week have come back. I underwrote one two years ago. It fell out a couple more times. This other one uh, fell out three times in this last year. And so basically, you know, you can also see when people are, are getting desperate because if someone wasn't desperate to sell, they would just stop listing it. They wouldn't list it anymore. They'd be like, okay, we'll just pull it back. We're not going to get the price we want. So that's also, you know, a good sign for me. I don't have to keep asking what's their motivation. They go, Oh, they just want to do another deal. I'm like, whatever. They just want a high price is what it is. Um, but I'm always asking for creative things. Like for example, Hey, would the uh, seller consider seller carry, you know, could we do, um, 
could we do a, a prep equity for for the current owner so they could stay in the deal and then basically just rake in some income from us. That way we don't have to go get another loan. And all that kind of stuff is really great right now because I don't know what's going to happen with lending. So that's something that now off the bat I'm asking them, are they creative? Are they willing to be creative? And the other thing now is I'm assuming there's um, 0% rent growth for 12 months. And so I say all that stuff right up front just to say like, that's what I'm going to underwrite at. And so you're obviously going to have to make some kind of price adjustment in, in, in to equal that adjustment. And if the seller's not willing to, I don't know what planet they're living on, but I'm on this one right now. So let me know when they can you know, consider that. And so both of these deals that have come back, they just, they want out, I guess. And so they're willing to do all those things. And so I'm like, cool, you know, now is when you get the good deals and uh, maybe we won't have to get a loan and all those good things. So being creative, um, that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, to, yeah, to be creative. And then I think that it's a great time. Well, and then getting back to data and echoing your point, Kaylee, uh, we went back and one of the things that we did when we adjusted our model um, for underwriting deals was we went back and looked at the recession and what things were at their peak and what they are now at the trough, right? Um, and so in Phoenix in particular, vacancy went from 8% to 12.5%. Um, and then rents declined by 9%. Then in year one and year two, uh, those numbers came up by less than a percent in both cases. And so we're including that in our underwriting and that's helped not only with brokers, but it's helped a lot with the banks when we're going back to the banks on some of these deals that we're refinancing um, and showing you know, that we're prepared to, to weather that storm, so to speak. So, uh, so Eric had brought up uh, an interesting question um, with, with the whole social distancing aspect of everything right now. Are, are people going to start looking outside of multifamily um, into single family just to have space and to be open? And, and on a similar note, um, urban living uh, with, with, you know, everybody's in tight quarters, no matter what kind of living situation you're in, is that going to start shifting again more towards sur suburban uh, neighborhoods? And, and if, if you guys want to talk on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier. Uh, I think we're seeing paradigm shifting that's going to be happening. And obviously, the longer this goes, the, the more that's going to stick. Um, Zoom and whatever we're on right now, uh, Ring and, um, you know, Skype and all that kind of stuff. People are learning how to use them. Even I had a, uh, my daughter's in figure skating. We had a figure skating board meeting and, you know, these people that aren't tech savvy are sitting on Zoom and we're doing a board meeting on Zoom. I mean, it's like, everybody's getting used to it. People are being productive at home and I, see companies allowing that to happen probably more and more. I think this is fast forwarding everything. And what that allows is for people to not live in the city anymore, live in tertiary markets. I think Kaylee's tertiary property is probably, probably going to be a slam dunk in my opinion. Um, so I think, I think these, as I said before, suburban located multifamily is going to be a good buy. I think urban core high rise is going to be a, an opportunity to purchase, but it's going to get well, I, in my opinion, pretty good. I, I have the opinion, single family, the people are going to actually buy single family. I think the single family is going to go up quite rapidly actually, because loan rates are, I mean, you can get a loan for, you know, three in the three percent. And, and I know that Chase, what, was it Chase that just said 20% down? You can still get an FHA 3.5% down. I mean, it, it's still pretty easy to qualify, quite frankly, for a home loan if you've got decent income and decent credit. So I think people are going to be buying these things. If you're stuck in the L block, you're going to go, I'm out of here. Like, I haven't been able to use my amenities for the last six months. Like, this is, this is ridiculous. I can't. I don't enjoy this anymore. And this is going to happen again. And you're freaked out about it. You're going, I want a yard. Like, I don't know who's in high rise right now, if anybody here is, but I'm sitting here on my property that has, you know, an acre and a half and I've got 200 acres right out my back door. 
uh, not mine, but uh, just woods. We love it. Like I couldn't imagine being stuck in downtown New York right now doing nothing. I, I think it's going to be a shift. I think you are spot on. Um, and what's funny is because I own a residential brokerage also. So right now it's, you have to pivot everything and change the way you're doing everything. And it's kind of interrelated and it's kind of not, but it is. So like you said, spreading out, for example, so I'm trying to solve problems. So we had 25 listings that were on market. We had to pull them all off like, like a month ago, basically, because we knew we couldn't get the fund, the, the spread that they needed to be able to sell it at. So then I've come up with some really creative things because I think you're correct that people are going to want to still move out into, you know, suburban areas where they're separated and they have their own yard and they have their own house and their individual HVAC that's not connected with anybody else's unit. Um, and so when that's happening, uh, you kind of have to get creative because right now it is, because I'm looking at MLS every day and it is changing to a buyer's market. It hasn't completely shifted yet, but it is. And it affects single family faster. And then the same kind of trends go into multifamily, I think. But um, so being able to give tours and do everything 100% digital, have, you know, um, basically like leasing appointments where you can go through the contract, you can go through all that kind of stuff on a Zoom call. You don't need to be there in person to do that stuff. Um, and then also getting back to the seller so that they can sell that house that they got into a pickle with where now they have this, uh, they're bleeding because they have, you know, the payments and the mortgage and the utilities and all that stuff they're hanging on to now. Now uh, I've reached out to an attorney to help them to be able to do owner financing so I can teach sellers how to do owner financing, uh, teach sellers also how to do lease options. So if they have somebody whose credit maybe isn't the best, they can put them in a lease option and have an agreement to get their credit where it needs to be within six months and then basically have them um, purchase the home because for lending, they'll be ready. Uh, but that way they can still move into single family homes. Like they said, the, the owner can finance it. That'll help a lot of people that don't have the best credit either be able to get into their homes. Also help out the seller because I mean, they basically have cash flow for life. So there's, there's a couple of options there in single family. Um, but then in multifamily, uh, depending on the cost and how that would work with down payment, usually seller financing is a larger down payment, so that may, may be impossible. But it, and so they may have to go, okay, I'm going to do an apartment. Now for apartments, you have to be a problem solver. So you're still seeing the same problems where people want to not have the same HVAC units. Like that's where the problem is in hotels and things like that or cruise ships is that, you know, it's an incubator. Everybody's connected and this is an aerosol. So it spreads that way through like metal piping and things from the seventies and whatnot. And so I'm lucky that all of our units we purchased are individual HVAC. Nobody is connected. And so that's great. And maybe will be a consideration moving forward into purchasing apartments. But also um, I reached out to a company that, um, that's in Australia and they're already doing this because obviously, as you know, like the federal budget, really they hadn't spent a lot of money uh, when it came to being uh, proactive with health, right? Or being proactive with the committee that looks out for worldwide diseases. Um, and that was a part of this whole problem. Well, um, that is what it is. We have no control over that. We can't change any of that. And I think this is going to come back in another wave, but what we can do is we can protect our space and our home. So the Australian company has come out with several different things, whether it's uh, full spectrum UV lights that you put into your place, uh, monitoring your water quality, um, monitoring your air quality and being able to see what kind of microbes are floating around in your home, um, being able to have like a private little backyard. So also looking for apartments that we could add a little space back there with like some ivy and have them have their own little space uh, versus community um, uh, amenities and things like that. Um, just kind of pivoting kind of what we're looking for, what we're going to provide. And so I'm talking to these people to figure out if it's cost effective for C-class. I don't know. For A-class, it definitely would be if there's still people left in those. But um, right now they're saying that they have a, uh, like a, one-stop shop. It's like a box full of stuff that's all retrofitted. So it's all those items, but basically to your pre-existing fixtures, to your pre-existing um, sink fixtures, to all that, you can just add these fixtures and things to it to be able to do that. So again, I'm, I'm looking at the cost, but if I can solve people's problems where they're, they're fearful and they're afraid, um, then being that differentiated property too, if you have like seven properties that you're competing with and you're the one that offers, you know, units that have that option and you can again, aftermarket add it and they can just pay an extra whatever people are going to want to come to your property and that's what i have to look at is how do we increase our demand by being unique and creative so just want to put that out there that that's that's exciting so yeah another um 
product type that's gotten popular here in Arizona, and I don't know if it's gotten popular in your guys' markets, is uh, like the single family build to rent rather than build to sell. Um, and a lot of those projects have construction bridge debt on them that these guys just, they're not going to survive. Um, and so there could be a really, really good opportunity there. If you have a background in construction, you can pick up those projects midstream, certainly. Yeah, those sound like attractive because it kind of solves both, right? Um, you don't have to become a homeowner, but you can still have your yard. Um, same with like the, the townhouse developments that you can have as rentals. Um, I like the, you know, more suburban, has a it, near park or, you know, good schools for sure, of, as always. But also, um, if, if you have a nice set up property that has either smaller individual buildings, so where you don't have a huge building with, you know, 50 to 100 to 200 tenants in it with common hallways but if you can have the ones that just they exit right out of their door and they're outside and they don't have to walk through a hallway i think those are those are really good buildings to get into um mostly c-class it seems like buildings but um you know those are those are nicer buildings i think in for this and i think this is long lasting in my opinion like whether the virus goes away and um and we're all back to normal and a month or two i still think the just the reality like the the memory of this is long lasting in my opinion people are going to be concerned about this happening again for the next you know five plus years in my opinion until the next event happens whatever it is absolutely um so i want to respect everybody's time so i'm, I'm gonna cut us off now if anybody wants to share any final final thoughts any, any final words um other than that um thanks to everybody for for signing on and talking and, and listening as well uh, i think this was pretty productive yeah thank you guys thank you ian or ian for putting this together i really appreciate you, you. Uh, and uh, anyone out there um I don't know if you guys are too, but we as a, an organization, we're looking to stack a lot of cash right now um, so that hopefully before uh, money doesn't mean anything, we have opportunities to get into real property uh, at a very discounted price. Um, so uh, if you want to contact any of us uh, for our respective areas, uh, we've got you know, Texas, uh, was it was um, Minneapolis, uh, Phoenix, uh, did I hit everybody or no? Uh, please reach out to us and obviously, you know, we'd be happy to um, get you hooked up with the next good deal. Awesome. All righty, guys. Have a good day. All right. Stay safe. Thank you.